Welcome to the Mad Ones. I'm your oh boy, I get to talk about what is probably my favorite subject of all time today, host Cam Harless. And with me, as always, is your very small but feisty hostess, Miss Jessica Green. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> hey, Jessica. How are you doing? I am small and I am feisty and I've had two Moscow mules, so this is going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a an exciting episode in my opinion, I mean, I think that most people should be more excited about this topic, but we'll we'll see what happens. Oh no, I just realized my cat's in here. Um, hopefully, oh. she doesn't chirp too much. Uh, but before we get started, I do need to let everyone know that this show is a hundred percent bought to, brought to you by the fans and patrons. So hit like, subscribe, and share the show with your friends. We have all sorts of topics that we've covered. Share them with someone who might gain something from them. Also, if you're a patron right now, you may be you can watch this, but if you're not. You're going to have to wait about two weeks to watch this episode. So if you, when you become a patron, you get things like early episodes. We'll do uh, Zoom parties and hangouts every month, and you'll get my gratitude. So, I mean, do it just for that. Do it because you love me. Um, also, <laughs> if you want to, to rep us, you can grab a shirt, a mug, a tank top. And tank tops, like I've always said, are the, the best shirt that you can wear. Uh, over at Mad wearethemadones.com slash store. There. There's the spiel. We can move on. Uh, joining us tonight is a bona fide doctor, not one of those lame medical ones, but a doctor of philosophy <laughs> with a master's of theology. He's written for more than uh, more than several websites, contributed to several books, and written articles for peer-reviewed journals. He's hosted podcasts, spoken at seminars, and written for Rethinking Hell. He's explained complicated theological issues to the reading math masses on Facebook, and you can find all of his stuff and all of his thoughts on his website, Right Reason. So please welcome our very smart and super handsome guest, Dr. Glenn, Glenn Peoples. Oh, hi there. <laughs> He's also from New Zealand. Is it okay? Let me ask you something real quick before we get into any weeds or fun stuff. I work with Australians, and I know separate, separate country, very. but there is one girl that works with us who is from and lives in New Zealand. And th she has the same name, Haley, as an as an American named Haley, and so mm -hmm. they were trying to decide what to how to distinguish them and not get confused on Zoom calls. And I was like, "Why don't you just call her Kiwi Haley?" And this is in my mind because I'm like, "Is Kiwi offensive? Is this an offensive thing?" <laughs> no, it's a it's a perfectly neutral term to refer to someone from New Zealand. That's what okay. I thought, but it was like we we won't call her that thing. And I was like, "Is it Kiwi?" Is Kiwi the bad thing? What if no, he no, was it's, like, it's... that's our word? <laughs> you said it with the hard eye. <laughs> All right. No, no. Um, it's it's a it's the equivalent of say calling an Australian an Aussie. It's just it's it's perfectly acceptable. Okay. Good so to know. so you you grew you grew up in I assume the Shire. Right. Yes, yes, I grew up in a in a fairly small mill town called Kawaro in in New Zealand, and and I've never lived anywhere else other than this fine country of ours. <laughs> Sounds lovely. I know I've seen too many videos and pictures of it um, because I'm like the biggest nerd when it comes to Lord of the Rings. So yeah, it's basically it looks like Lord of the Rings everywhere. <laughs> oh. basically <laughs> sounds awesome <laughs> so we are doing this is actually our second episode uh for easter because we wanted to kind of for christmas we did four and because you know you can do that the full month of december but with mm. easter it's you know i wanted to get it within april because it's like i perfectionist mind i don't know what it is but we have two so last week to those watching uh, in the future was Cody Cook. And we talked about the um, what is the gospel and, you know, how uh, the gospel isn't just in the New Testament, but it starts in Genesis and is completed through mm. through that, through what Jesus did and his sacrifice and all of that. But I wanted the Wednesday previous to Easter or pa Pascha, as Jessica would call it, since she's Greek Orthodox, um, to, you know, focus on the resurrection. Cause I feel like when you talk about kind of the ultimate Christian hope with people, unless they've read NT Wright's uh, surprised by hope, they typically think of some disembodied heaven. <sighs> and I kind of want to talk about not only how important what Jesus did and how important his resurrection was, but how important ours is. And I, I wish like, NT Wright didn't get all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> 
he's just the I think he's just the biggest name out there on that, isn't yeah. he? Yeah, he, he he popularized what some very unpopular Christian theologians had been saying for a very long time, and then all of a sudden it became trendy, and people credited him, and that we and we were standing around going, "What about us? We've been saying this the whole time." <laughs> right. <laughs> And that's what's so funny is because, you know, even so surprised by hope is um, which, like I said, you guys or you said you, you guys were talking about it far before he popularized it. But it's the idea that we need to recapture the hope that Christianity offers. And that great hope is the resurrection and, yeah. uh, you know, living life on Earth as Earth was supposed to be how we're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people throughout you know, a couple, what is it, a couple thousand years now, maybe, maybe less than that, have been, Give have <laughs> gotten this kind of Gnostic dualist idea that it's a disembodied heaven that we go to and that earth doesn't matter and that our bodies are, our, our material bodies are bad. And so I'm mm. like, let's, I can't set the record straight like you you do nor regularly or like N.T. Wright had a hand in, it's very small, and minuscule hand in. But it's you know, so, I want to talk about it. <laughs> it's so pervasive, and and even when so so, um, I mean, I'm older than you, so I've had experiences that that you may or may not have had. But my father died a few years ago, and I was at his funeral. Uh, I gave a sort of eulogy, but the priest gave the, when well, the the priest gave the, um, oh, what was it the. Uh, they don't call it a sermon. The, the funeral homily. They call them okay. homilies. They're not, not sermons. <laughs> and he said, look, is there anything that you'd like me to, to talk about or, or to really focus on? And so my sister and I sat there and we, and this was a, a feature of my eulogy as well, but we, we really emphasized that we wanted him to talk about the resurrection of the dead because that was so important to us. And he thought he was doing so by, by talking about the fact that dad's now in heaven because because when he heard resurrection of the dead, he just heard future life, which for him meant heaven. So he just spent the whole time talking about heaven. And it's it's like that for so many people. Even when you draw it to their attention, they go, yeah, yeah, sure, of course, resurrection. Now let's keep talking about heaven. Well, yeah, and, and, and sometimes even in – because when I grew up, I had that idea of heaven in that way, that disembodied heaven. But at the same time, I read about the resurrection of the body, and I was very confused about how I was hearing one thing and reading something else. You yeah, know, like I, yeah. I never and, and, read. You know, Christian statements of faith managed to combine them, but I, yeah, I wish they didn't. <laughs> yeah, well, I was I was talking to um, a friend of mine the other day, and we were talking. We've you know you you've done work with rethinking hell, and you've. Uh, I mean, you've done a lot of work, and so you, you've dealt with hell, you've dealt with heaven, and you've dealt with um, resurrection. But one of the things that I said to my friend was like, I can't think of words that are less helpful than heaven, hell, and soul within mm -hmm. Christianity. Like these are words that I, I, I can't – you can't have the conversations because they're so yeah, immensely and, packed. Yeah, and one, one solution that – um. Some some Christians with more or less the same theology as me, um, one solution they try to implement is they use these words, and every time they use them, they offer a definition of how they in particular are using them, which is different from how other people use them. It's just so right. awkward. I mean, take soul, for example. They'll say, yeah, I believe in souls, but when I say soul, I mean that we are a soul, and a soul is like this, that, and the other thing, and it's nothing like what anyone else thinks a soul is. It's so much more economical to say, no, I don't believe in souls. Here's what I believe instead. Yeah. <laughs> so much easier and clearer. Well, and it's like, you know, Dante laid like such a large foundation for hell that when you say the word hell, which is the etym etymologically, like when I think of where that comes from, I think of Norse mythology and the, the, the goddess hell. Is that where we got this word from? Well, no, I mean, hell is a word. Uh, uh, and I forget the, 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 the language that the word hell comes from, but the word just means hidden. Like it's the hidden place. It's, it's, and um, I, there's never, and I don't even know if the Norse goddess hell has any relationship to a, a state of eternal torment. So I think yeah. that's, a, that's an attempt to try to be a bit too clever when you say, ha, oh, you got it from pagan mythology. No, they didn't get it from well, pagan mythology. That's just a well, word. Right. Right. And that's what I was wondering, just because I the only other place that you really that I've read outside of Christian circles talk about this word hell, because, you know, there are typically other specific words, Hades, um, yeah. you know, different realms and hell is a realm and a person in Norse mythology. 
and yeah, it's yeah. the it's like the bad dead go to hell in yeah can I, hell it, yeah can i can i go back for a second when you guys were talking about souls mm. um you were saying it was it's more economical to say you don't believe in a soul can you kind yeah. of expand on that idea are you saying sort of, sort of like as to illustrate that there is not a separation between our material bodies and our spirits yeah so i'm and, and this is another word that has a whole lot of meanings. I'm a materialist when it comes to human beings. And that doesn't mean I believe in greed, <laughs> but right. it just means that I think we are physical parts of the universe. And that's okay. what we are. And God brought us to life and God can have a relationship with creatures of that nature. Uh, so in other words, I reject what's called uh, mind-body or body-soul dualism. This idea that we really are an immaterial person that inhabits this body and that when yeah. the body expires, we can escape the body and, and live in another state. I, I deny all that. Okay. Yeah. So and, and that was one of my questions before I got before I got my biblical studies degree or start, got into that at all, was I had a girlfriend who told me it's it wasn't even dualist. It was like. You, there, th there's like a three parts. Oh yeah, there's person. a trichotomist position. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which never is, even you heard know, you, that word. Yeah, you you have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit, and these are three separate things that come together. So kind of mm. like a hypo hypostasis of humanity. And it's and sense. it's not just that you believe in a body, soul, and spirit. There is a sense in which we can say we do, but they are, they are distinct substances, which is, is yeah. the, the crucial thing. What is the difference then between a body and soul in that scenario? Or I'm sorry, not a body and a soul, a spirit and a soul. Well, they would say that your soul is is the immaterial thing that gives life to your body, but your spirit is a further immaterial thing that enables you to relate to God specifically. Hmm. So the way the way people explained it, then I heard a pastor use it, was he would say that your body is your body, that's explainable. And he would say they would say your soul is your mind, will, and emotions, and okay. your spirit is and that would they'd kind of leave it there, like like they didn't have much of an explanation, except that's the god the god part. Mm. <laughs> Interesting. But this is this is why I thought you'd be really great for this conversation, because a lot of people, when they think about Jesus's resurrection and our eventual resurrection, they never stop to think about perhaps what did what was the second temple idea of the soul what what did the sadducees think versus the pharisees what was the common idea of soul in the jews of that time and so yeah. what did this mean that we miss well that's one of the big <laughs> i don't want to say it's a big beef that i have as though i'm carrying around this chip on my shoulder but it's a very common mistake that people make when they approach uh, or when they think, oh, I'm going to get a historical background and because that's the smart thing to do. And so they say, I want to know what the Jewish view was, or I want to know what the Greek view was. There is no such thing as yeah. the Jewish view. There's no such thing as the Greek view. There were a multiplicity of views uh, in, in both of those scenarios and others, you know, Persians, Egyptians, right. and, and so on. Um, so a bit of a, okay, something of a survey. So... Um, <laughs> So a lot of people say the Old Testament isn't concerned with the afterlife or it doesn't have anything to say. That's an overstatement. There are some references um, to a future life in the Hebrew scripture, but there's, there's not a whole lot that's made very clear at all. And maybe I wish that weren't so, but it is, it's the truth. So yeah. there are some things like Ecclesiastes says that God will hold you to account for how you live this life, which is possibly a hint at a future life in judgment. Or the psalmist wrote that... Um, he, or at least someone, will not be abandoned to Sheol, which is Hades, the grave or death. Uh, and the New Testament Christians obviously took that as a reference to resurrection. Look at, look at St. Peter's talk on the, on, on the day of Pentecost. Um, but it's mostly just sort of hints around the edges. There's something to which they are pointing, but they don't quite seem to know what it is. Um, and so their focus was really... Uh, and this is where liberals get something right, at least. Uh, the focus of the mm -hmm. Old Testament scripture really is on God's covenant with his people right now in the land of mm -hmm. the living and being faithful to that. There are some exceptions, and they're quite clear exceptions. Though. I mean, Daniel 12, 2, uh, as you start getting quite late in the New Testament, very late, actually, and sorry, Old Testament, uh, that's the most explicit reference to the resurrection, where, where the writer says, you know, many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Uh, and it talks about some rising to everlasting life, some rising to shame and everlasting contempt. Uh, it, it, contempt, by the way, is not the emotion of the person who is in contempt. It's the emotion of 
of those who hold that person in contempt. So it's like God holds them in contempt forever. Um, in Daniel, though, where he talks about people who sleep in the dust of the earth, he uses language that is that appears elsewhere in Scripture, and it might suggest that when people talk about those who are in the dust of the earth having some sort of future, there was sort of a sort of a shared understanding that there there is a reference here to a future physical life of some sort. I mean, the, the one one other obvious one is Isaiah twenty six, which says, "Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy." With this, this idea of a very physical future hope of some sort, but again, they don't name it. You know, they don't they don't actually say what will happen. And, and, and as you say, it's it's the second temple period of Judaism, where belief in the resurrection started to really become more both more widely and more explicitly expressed. Uh, now, you get some skeptics of religion who will say things like, um, oh, this is where, Juda especially skeptics of Christian religion in particular, yeah. who will say that, um, well, the Jews just stole the idea of resurrection from the Zoroastrians of Persia, and that's why it came about, came about late. Um, now, firstly, bear in mind, these are the same skeptics who say that that Christians stole a dying and rising God from Mithra and all those other pagan religions where they get just about every single detail wrong. So just yeah. bear in mind, these are people who believe almost anything if they think it discredits what, Zeit, what we believe. Zeitgeist critics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But also it, the fact that, that uh, a religion like Zoroastrianism of Persia uh, included a belief in resurrection does not establish that Jews copied it. Uh, because resurrection is mentioned in the Hebrew scriptures, those ones that we mm. just saw, which, which predate the interaction of Judaism and Zoroastrianism. They just don't do it very often. Uh, one possible reason, and, and I'm, I'm speculating, but this is what we do. Uh, one yeah. possible reason for a more focused hope of, of on life after death is that um, the events of history, and especially things like the dissolution of the northern kingdom of Israel uh, or the, the Babylonian exile, when things like that happen, they they make you rethink stuff. <laughs> you know, the nationalistic hope in this life started to look more doubtful for Israel. And mm -hmm. so you have to place your hope somewhere else. And so they had, had started thinking, well, look, if if this doesn't pan out the way that we <laughs> are hoping, how is it going to pan out? And so they, and their thoughts started to drift uh, towards the afterlife. And resurrection is definitely there in, say, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so... A couple of examples. There's a scroll discovered in the 1940s, 1947, I believe, referred to as 1QH, very creative name. <laughs> um, and and it, it features the familiar language of those who lie in the dust, saying that in the future they will raise up a standard and the worms of the dead will lift up a banner one day. This very, very physical <laughs> hope yeah. of some kind coming out, you know, the worms and the rot and the dust will, you'll come <laughs> back from that. Um, and there's another scroll called the Messianic Apocalypse, where the author says that God will heal the slain, like heal the dead, and, and he will make the dead live, and that he is the God who will give life to the dead of his people. Um, and there's another, so there's a practice in, in, in not in scripture, but in Jewish writings, uh, of basically taking old writings and giving new meanings to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, there's a work called Pseudo Ezekiel, where the writer says that the resurrection is just like what happened in Ezekiel's vision, you know, where the, the physical body parts rise up and get stuck back together and, and hmm. you have this mighty army. And there are other references in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. But the point is, Resurrection isn't there often, but it's de it is there, and it's it's mentioned in some detail, but again, not all that much. It's it's not a major theme, and and so you have this situation in in, in Second Temple Judaism, which is the era in which Jesus came onto the scene, where there wasn't, as I said, a unified Jewish view that developed. Yeah, because there were different sects of Judaism. And so there were those who stressed the immortality of the soul. There, there were the Sadducees who, who explicitly said there is no resurrection of the dead. That's what they were famous for. And so mm -hmm. they were 
So they were sad, you see. <laughs> and her mom uh, told me that yeah, the other day when I told her you were having on. Uh, there were the Pharisees, who, and we know that some of them at least held to a version of both the immortality of the soul and the resurrection of the body. So there's no way to take one total package of Jewish beliefs about death and resurrection and say that, uh, well, we know that that. Paul was a Jew, and so, and so yeah. when he became a Christian, he just held his Jewish view. Uh, right. you, you can't really say that he had plenty of Jewish resources to draw on. That's what we can say, and that's certainly the the overall worldview uh, from which he came. But what he had was a Christian view. It was one that he learned um, when he was confronted by the risen Jesus, and it's one that he learned through his connection with the Christian Church. You know, when he was converted, he went and spent time with the apostles. Uh, so that is the worldview that that we have. It is not simply a Jewish view. Yeah. Well, and it's if like anything, a, a, if anything, it goes speaks to sort of like a. Um, I, I don't want to use the word anti-Jewish because I don't mean um, against people, <laughs> but his view uh, was definitely not in line with what he should have been doing. He had no reason. Um, if if you take it like purely on it, what was his motivations? If you didn't believe that he ran into a resurrected Jesus. Why would somebody who had this, you know, high position within the Jewish community suddenly flip on a dime and decide to do what is essentially opposite to what his view was in mm. the first place? And so he was yeah. taking a sort of like an antithetical view to himself. Yeah, if it was a um, if it was a Jewish movement, it was a very countercultural Jewish movement. Right. Right. Thank you for saying that much better than I could have. <laughs> yeah. yeah, better than anti-Jewish. Right. That's, yeah, we you. don't want to go there. <laughs> no, no, no. But definitely antithetical to. That's what I find so convincing about his story is that um, there wasn't a lot of profit in it for him. He had a high position. He was doing well within yeah. his community, and then suddenly flipped on a dime to doing something that would essentially lead to him being killed in a very terrible he way. He knowingly gave himself a much worse life by right. uh -huh. by by becoming a Christian evangelist. Yeah. So one of the things, like when, when I asked you, you know, what was the Jewish view? I was like, I should have said what, I should have said that differently because immediately you're like, I'm going to correct you. And I'm like, no, I know, I know. I've read this. One of my favorites. Know, that's what I had prepared to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's great though, because I haven't heard these things. So it's actually really informative mm. to me. So I'm glad no. we went through that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was, um, one of my, one of, I, I can't, I don't know if it was um, Tim Mackey or not. But uh, I was reading something or watching something probably a couple months ago and where that where I was corrected earlier, where he goes, you don't you don't say what did Judaism believe you asked. You, you have to realize that there were Judaisms. Mm -hmm. There were several Judaisms. And so it's really interesting. And you can correct me and I, I want you to correct me, but wasn't kind of previous to Jesus. I know that the Pharisees were kind of from what I know, Pharisees were kind of becoming more dominant over the Sadducees? Well, yes and no. I mean, yeah, over the Sadducees, yes, but not over the Jewish people generally. Okay. It's, it's, um, most Jews were common people. They were ordinary. Like if you were to walk up to the average Catholic and say, so are you a Dominican or a Jesuit? They'll be like, well, a what? <laughs> uh, right. neither, neither of those things. And that was true of the average devout Jew as well. They weren't members of these of these factious parties. They were people who were just trying to be good, faithful Jews. Uh, and if you ask them their views on these theological subjects, chances are they didn't have a, a, a strong view. Um, yeah, so it, most Jews were not Sadducees. Most Jews were not Pharisees. They were not Essenes. They were not this, that, or the other thing. They were just Jews. And yeah. and they did, and it's it's when you start getting into these more developed theologies of of issues like um, the law, how much of the scripture do you do you treat as authoritative? That was a big difference between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, uh, or or spirits or angels or, or resurrection. Then you start uh, seeing these parties emerge as to how they view these things. Right. So it it sounds like, and like I said, correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like there was a lot of speculation in the second temple period after oh, yeah. <laughs> after, after the, you know, the exile kind of left them on shaky ground and you have the Sadducees who tell you not to read Daniel. You have the Pharisees who say, no, you have to read Daniel. Mm. Um, but it seems like a really good time for someone like Jesus to come in and be like, okay, so here's what's going on. 
And I have this other, I have these other people who are going to tell you more once I'm gone. <laughs> mm. Just set the record straight. Um, yeah. Go ahead. I feel like you had something to say. No, no. I, I was thinking. Yeah, that's basically right. I mean, it was. I mean, there were other, other much more short-lived messianic movements, and kind of for that reason, there was, there, there was an opening. Yeah. For, for you know, there, there was more of a more of an openness to, let's see what this new teacher has to say. Basically. That's kind of the impression that I got where they were, um, I can't remember the specific passage, but it was basically one of the Jewish leaders saying, let him do his thing, because if he is a Messiah, then you don't yeah. want to get in his way. And if he's not, he'll peter out on his own. Yeah, like all the other Messiahs have, basically. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Which well, is a good approach Sometimes to Sometimes it was take. a disaster, but yeah. Right. <laughs> is so there a specific... I haven't heard of any of the times where it was a disaster. Can you give me an example of that? Um, now, I'm going to be talking about stuff where I'm not really an expert, but um, let me just quickly check his name. I don't want to say it wrong because that would be embarrassing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> My mind goes immediately to, to Barabbas. <laughs> Barabbas, as a You don't mean the, the Barabbas uh. that was in prison at the same time as Jesus, right? Yeah, that oh, that okay. is oh. that is what some people think he was. Uh, well, he, was, he attempted to lead an insurrection, which could have meant a messianic movement. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the guy I'm thinking of is um, Simon Bar Kokhba, mm -hmm. but okay. I don't know much about him. Or I mean, there were there were times when, when you think about the the Maccabean revolt um, in the what we would call the intertestamental period. Uh, where messianic and nationalistic hope drove <laughs> a very ill-fated attempt to revolt against Rome. Um, yeah. Had Jesus been someone like that, then, but it was pretty obvious that he wasn't, I think, hopefully. Yeah. So the, the sort of um, downfall of these previous Messiah-like figures is that they attempted to be military leaders. Mm, I'm not really the person to talk too much about um, Jewish fair messianic enough. movements. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> that has been guess, what I've what I seem to have read a lot of. I guess that's a, uh, something I didn't realize that I was interested in until this moment. So now I have a, a new avenue to path <laughs> going your exploring down. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it, since we can't lay kind of a ground floor of what you know judaism believed at that point because i mean it didn't get it didn't get really um codified until what 500 years after yeah I mean, we can say some things for example based on jewish yeah. theology so for example if a, if a new testament christian came out and said jesus was resurrected well jews know what resurrection means whether they believe in it or not is is is, is secondary so, and, and the reason okay. I point that out is you get people like uh, Richard Carrier who will say that um, the New Testament was, was to be understood as referring to a sort of, I think it's him. If it's not him, then, then there are others who say this, that physical bodily resurrection is not really where it's all about. Resurrection was a sort of spiritual or invisible um, ascent. Well, no. If you say resurrection to a first century Jew, they know what you're talking about. And if you want them to understand something that's not physical, you better say so. And the New Testament Christian didn't. They just talked about resurrection and an right. empty tomb, as in a body right. that wasn't there anymore. Well, and, and you would say that, I don't know, well, I mean, this is what N.T. Wright said, but would you say that their understanding of resurrection was at the end of time, the general resurrection? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And this is... And this is something that Christian apologists appeal to, and I think rightly so. Uh, people, um, mm -hmm. yeah, they wouldn't have had any real interest in in coming up with a story about a Messiah who died and rose again, sort of in the middle of history, as, as yeah. it were, not because <laughs> that wasn't the Jewish hope. Uh, and so they wouldn't say, look, Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Look at what he did, just as we expected the Messiah to do. They would say, no, we didn't. We didn't expect the Messiah to do to, to die and rise again, uh, absent the general resurrection. Yeah. Yeah, he's the, he's, he's the first fruits of resurrection. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what St. Paul um, refers to him as in, in 1 Corinthians 15, the first fruits, which is like a sample of, of all the others that are to come. So at the time of Jesus... 
most people, when they heard resurrection, they would have their minds would have been brought to the general resurrection of all people, or just all yeah. Jew, Jews. Would it? Or did did they? Believe, uh, well, do you it think would there depend was on idea? the on your view on the scope of salvation, but at least and most importantly, the nation of Israel. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a view at the time of there would be people who would be saved and people who would not be. Like they oh, would yeah. be sorting out. Definitely. Right? The the um the concept of Gehenna as as an estate or place of a final punishment of those who were lost was was a very alive and well at the time mm -hmm. of Jesus. So when when you know Matthew ten twenty eight for example, when what well, Jesus would have been speaking in, in Aramaic, uh, but you know the equivalent of Gehenna. Um, people knew what he was talking about. He was talking about what we call hell, you know, the, the last judgment and the punishment of the lost. Right. And, and one of the things that I keep, I, I was every now and then, since I've been in the rethinking hell group for like years now. And I, you know, I read Edward Fudge and I read stuff that you wrote, stuff that Chris wrote. Chris actually came on our show to talk about conditional immor immortality right. last year. Um, but one of the things that I keep and I don't know if you have this pet peeve, but I, I was he I heard someone talking the other day about what hell is and their primary point that they used to describe hell and what Jesus taught was that Gehenna or the Valley of Hymnon was a garbage dump outside of Jerusalem. <laughs> and essentially that what Jesus was saying that wasn't that there was a uh, fiery judgment in some sense, but that it was Jesus didn't want our lives to be garbage on earth. And I was like, but that last what? line threw me because usually, usually those who make that line will be, will, will say, um, God doesn't want us to be discarded into, into the fiery dump because the, the version of the story usually is that Gehenna was this fiery garbage dump with, with, with things were thrown into and burned. Um, the yeah. trouble is Gehenna was never a garbage dump. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's like a 20th. Oh, no, no. When was that first? 13th century. The, yeah, medieval. It was first. Yeah, that sounds about right. But it, yeah, Gehenna simply wasn't. I mean, there, there is um, archaeological evidence of, of garbage dump, but not in Gehenna. It's in a, it's in a was it the Kidron Valley or something nearby. But um, yeah, totally. Hmm. But I just... That's, that's one of my like pet peeves is when I hear that because I, that was one of those things that I didn't understand because i what i kept hearing was i'd be in church and people would make these statements like that uh three parts of a human being the three mm. part human and then i'd be like okay where is that in the bible and they'd be like oh well it's not and i'm like can you point to me where you got this and sometimes it's like i think that the gehenna thing is in a lot of commentaries but it's it was funny to, for me to find out it wasn't until it there it was like a uh, a commentary on Psalm 26, maybe, by a, a Jewish uh, rabbi in like the 13th century. That's the the earliest thing they ever found. It's one of those things that. like the eye of the needle. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but when Jesus said, you know, it's difficult for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's it's um, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, which is mm -hmm. to say, look, it's kind of impossible. But then some commentator, maybe a rich man, <laughs> came up. <laughs> came up and I forget how I don't know how long ago it was came up with this claim that there is a small gate in the wall of Jerusalem called the eye of a needle and a camel can go through it it just has to take all that you have to night travelers have to stop and take all the baggage off and and so on and so forth so so a rich man can enter the kit there was never any such thing but it, but it somehow became this established you know and preachers would sound clever by saying the same as Gehenna oh as it happens Gehenna was a rubbish dump oh and people think oh gosh he knows something <laughs> no <laughs> so just to be clear that that gate thing is not a thing no, no such made that thing. up nope. oh wow it's, okay it's just it's just a from what i understand it's it's a probably a a, an idiom from that time period that the people he was talking to would have understood very easily. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But it doesn't, but there are a lot of things that don't quite translate as well out it's of Greek. Idiom or, that means something that can't be done. <laughs> yeah. But the people are yeah. like, what do you mean a camel and a needle? Why would you, why would you say camel? <laughs> well, camel starts with this letter and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. So, uh, when we're looking at this time period and people are downtrodden, I mean, the, the Jews at that time, 
they had a long history of exile. And then, you know, they came back with Hosea. Uh, and then they were taken over by the uh, the Romans. And so these are a people mm. who don't, who have like a national, a nation, but they mm. don't actually have it. And so yeah. th these are people who are looking towards the future and that hope and it's muddled and people think different things about it or don't believe it at all. But it seems to be, like I said earlier, it seems to be something that Jesus and his disciples made very clear throughout scripture as, as far as anyone who reads it, instead of just listening to what their favorite pastor or the pastor they grew up with says, like, if you read it, resurrection of the body, Paul talks about it. Like that's, mm. you know, it's in first Corinthians 15, like resurrection is a big deal. But oh, yeah, we've John lost, we've, yeah, 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 we've lost the plot. And so I, I guess my overall question for this topic in this episode is uh, a, a lot of times every show that we have, and I'll ask you this and it'll be super, superfluous for me to ask you this, but before we leave, I don't know if you've heard the concept of pills, like the red pill and the black pill, white pill, that stuff. Um, like, like the matrix. Yeah. Like the matrix. A little bit, so yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm but, familiar with the concept of being red pilled, which means having your eyes open and going, "Oh, what I've been believing is all wrong," basically. Right, and so, so that was that was the main idea, and then nerds on 4chan added a bunch of other pills, and oh, so <laughs> uh, the white pill is kind of like the hope thing, and for a while, when we would do the shows, we would ask people what their white pill is, and we decided that's kind of stupid, so we moved to just talking about hope because mm. it's better that way. Um, but what is, since you've done a lot of writing about this and judgment and um, materialism or uh, is physicalist a bad term now? No, it's okay. Okay. Cause I, I call, I called Chris one of them and he was like, well, I don't call myself that anymore because, and I was like, I don't know what I'm like, which word is okay here. <laughs> but uh, can you walk us through the hope that we have and what it actually looks looks like compared to this disembodied heaven that so many people currently believe in? Yeah, yeah. So while it might seem like I'm defining or describing, describing really, a hope that is different from traditional Christianity, I don't think so. At least, At least I would say it depends on how far back you go. My hope is the hope of the Apostles' Creed, the hope of the Nicene Creed. You know, we look to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. To come. That is my hope. Yes. And that is my hope. That is, <laughs> um, the Orthodox um, believe in the resurrection of the body. Yeah. We don't believe that some um, disembodied ghost of, that lives inside of us goes up to an ethereal plane called heaven. We believe that the earth will be resurrected into the state that it was before the fall and that we will exist in our bodies, that our bodies will be resurrected. Hmm. And so um, I am finding out slowly through the course of this episode that that isn't what most Christians believe. Well, they do, that's <laughs> the thing. They, they do believe in it as well. It's kind of a yes and. Yeah. Um, okay. So there'll be a, a, a book like Heaven is So Real. Uh, and I, I haven't read it, so I, I can't pretend to know all the details of it, but it's about people who have seen heaven or, or, or perhaps gone to heaven or so on, where if you ask a person like that, do you believe that Jesus was bodily raised? Yes, yes, I do. Do you believe in the resurrection? Yes, yes, I do. And yet when they talk about hope, they just consume all their time talking about heaven. Uh, yeah. When when Jesus, any time that Jesus was that Jesus spoke directly to the hope that he brought, at least when it comes to the hope of a future life. He never even once mentioned the prospect of, well, there is, there is, a, there is a case that people argue about, namely the thief on the cross. But when, when he was delivering teaching about the hope that he made possible, it was always the resurrection. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, he said of himself, I am the resurrection and the life. You never separate those two things. Mm. Um, whoever believes in me, uh, even though he dies, yet he will live. Why? Because he's the resurrection, not because he makes it possible to go to heaven. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's the same when and, and again I know that there are passages that people argue about, but I look at I look at Saint Paul, and when when the time comes, any time he explicitly says or in 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 whatever words he chooses to use, I want to talk to you now about the hope that we have. Because there are there are side comments he makes that people argue about, like what does he mean when he talks about being absent from the body and present with the Lord? What's he talking about? But any time that he says, "Look, I'm going to talk to you now about our hope," I, he does that in examples like First uh, Thessalonians, where he where's the second? It's been a while since I looked at it. Where he says, "I don't want you to be ignorant about those who have died," so that so that you mourn like people who have no hope. And then he goes on to explain why he doesn't want them to mourn. And what he goes on to talk about is the fact that we believe that Jesus will return. And just as he came back from the dead, so he will bring those in Christ who are asleep with him back from the dead. And then we'll be gathered together with them. Anytime, he's, anytime he wants to comfort people, he says, this is why I want you to be okay about death. It's, be, it's because... We're going to come back from it. Or, or in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, where, he, where he says, look, some of you have said that there is no resurrection of the dead. I want you to know what that implies, if you're right. Number, and, and he gives several explanations of what that implies. So he says, from a redemptive point of view, if there's no resurrection of the dead, well, then Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And that's, that's a real problem when it comes to soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, because we're, we're still in our sins. If, if you know, because... Um, I mean, Jesus died as an atoning sacrifice, but his resurrection is what makes possible for us a new nature. Uh, okay. And he says, if, if, if Jesus didn't rise again, you're still in your sins, man. That's a really big problem. But then he makes another argument. Well, he, he says, look, if there's no resurrection, then why am I facing animals in, in the arena? Why am I facing wild beasts? Why am I doing this? Because there, there would be no future for me. And then he said, mm -hmm. if the dead are not going to rise, then let's eat drink and be merry for tomorrow we die think about what that means it means i mean because if you believed that there was still the prospect of a future life in heaven disembodied then saint paul is wrong he could say if, if the dead don't rise then let's eat drink and be merry because tomorrow we die you could raise your hand and say no well no we don't we go to heaven even if even if the dead don't rise and so he would have to say, well, yeah, okay, apart from that. But but his point is, no, if, if there's no resurrection, there's no future. There's nothing. You may as well just enjoy this life because when you die, it's over. Um, so all of the hope for the future in the New Testament, every bit of it uh, is only possible because you are going to physically rise again. And sorry if I'm like the slow Loris in the conversation here, but I'm making a connection now to the concept of death in the first place, which occurs in the human being because of the fall, because of sin. Mm. So it's not as though if there weren't sin, um, we would ever die in the first place. And so it's the effect of the sin which causes the death of the body. And so if Christ removes our sins, mm. what he's effectively removing from us is death. Yeah. And so our bodies then live. There would they would not die. Yeah, and and, and um so much of, of the book of Romans, Romans five and six is all about that. This idea that um you know death is connected to sin and and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, which in context means uh, an undoing of the sort of death that Adam is afflicted with, which which God spells out in Genesis. You know, you were dust and to dust you shall return. So, re yeah, resurrection is what undoes all of that. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of, um, while reading, I, I, I keep in mind for context for you, I've only become a Christian like two and a half years ago. So I'm Welcome. just, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm just now sort of like wading my way through this Old Testament. Like I barely touched the Old Testament. I'm wading through the New Testament. I'm trying to understand it in context of the audience that it was intended for, what it means in my life personally. And so um, it is difficult sometimes to make these connections, especially when it comes to the idea of um, that our bodies are dying connected to the sins. Um, this this is diff a difficult concept. If we think that our bodies are just these discarded items that we no longer need after death because our perfected ethereal soul rises into the heavenly plane, 
then, you know, sort of what is the point of being, you know, how am I trying to say this? Okay, so that our, our, our bodies die, it, it, it would be as though that was the intent in the first place. Like it's just these these yeah. terrible material shells that need to be discarded because they're sinful and awful in the first place. But that doesn't seem to have been the original intent. Like why create the body at all if it's just this yeah, discarding if, if shell? A disem, if a disembodied heaven was the eternal state, then yeah, that would be right. We'll be like, well, if that's the perfect state, if heaven is perfect and there are no bodies there, then... Why? Why are we here and now? But, but I mean, that's that's not generally what Christian. Even, even I think Christians who hold unfortunate views on on heaven and hell, um, they still do believe in the resurrection. They just say, "Oh yeah, and, and the resurrection." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sort, of, sort of as a tack on to the. To, to, I've kind of gotten the impression that people believe that Christ is resurrected, and they'll say, "Yes, I believe in the resurrection of Christ. Christ's body rose from the dead." But that doesn't seem to be the belief that uh, we will do so. More so that, okay, my grandfather yeah. has died and then his little spirit has left the, the shell. The shell will rot away and be discarded. That's and then interesting. We'll go that's kind of a, um, yeah, that seems to me to be a common view in a sort of cultural Christianity. Like yeah. in, 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 a, in a secular culture, which has just kind of picked up some spirituality from the Christian faith. And so right. they'll talk yeah. about, you know, so-and-so watching over me or or, right. or being in heaven now and so on. Um, yeah. And, and, so, and that's probably true in, I can't really speak to American culture, but yeah, it, it is true here. Even that's people awesome. who might not say, I hold religious beliefs, they'll talk about like, people being in a better place or watching down on us or so on. Yeah. But the idea of physical resurrection would be, oh no, that's a, it's embarrassing. That's a religious doctrine. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it, it's kind of funny because the idea that I would die and then have to look down and watch my family grieve over my death, watch people who I love exist without my help in any way. That sounds like a hellish torture, not some kind of, a reward I've gotten for being very good on earth. Yeah. And so you'd I, be looking down going, gosh, if only they knew. <laughs> <But> they, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that was one of the things that kind of threw me. And one of the things that I kind of had a transformation of mind in um, was how many people, well-meaning Christians, and even some that I wouldn't say were just like secularized, um, would talk about death they would separate the conversation about death in these kind of two s different categories. There was death that was bad. And then there was like, death is my friend. That's, that's, I get to be with Jesus in death. So death, I want that, you know? And I find that it, so it, horrible. Sort of sense. Like just, I mean, what's the word I'm looking for? Existentially horrible to, to talk about death as in any way, um, a friend or something to look forward yeah. to, or I just look at that and think, man, way to confirm the very worst. I mean, you'd have so skeptics and critics of the, of the Christian faith, and I think of someone like Richard, no, not Richard Dawkins, uh, Christopher Hitchens, who I thought was wildly mistaken about everything. Yeah, <laughs> but Christians gave him ammunition where he would talk about religious believers who basically long for death and who don't mind dying in the name of their cause or whatever. And I just think, yeah, I mean, you are fundamentally wrong about the Christian view of death, but unfortunately, you're not short of examples. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's like I was I having gave a conversation. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I, one of the last, well, no, I, don't, I don't know if it was one of the last talks I gave, but a little while ago, I gave a talk called um, Death, uh, what was it? Some terrible name like Fear, Hell, and Death or something. And, and the whole idea <laughs> was that the way that, the way that I view uh, human nature, namely without souls, and the way that I view death, and the way that I view hell, is horrible, and we need to see it as horrible. Yeah. And and it 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 um. And it's good that it's horrible, <laughs> in a way, because okay. it it involves us not being in a state of denial about death and how absolutely wretched and and terrifying, and bad death is and it is in scripture when you read saint paul on the way that he talks about the hope of resurrection he talks about death as an enemy that must be defeated one day mm -hmm. uh, it'll be the last enemy that is defeated in in the general resurrection of the dead um and it's not it's not an experience it's it's 
total lack of experience. It's not like anything. It is non-being. It is fearful. It is the worst. It is it's the root of all human anxiety and dread. You know, it's, yeah. And so when, when I hear, anytime I hear or I read people talking about uh, death being sort of a sweet transition, I think, no, no time for that. I would never share a platform or make space for anyone who wanted to, to convey that message. And it shows kind of a very modern sort of like bubble mindset because death now is this sort of like clinical process that is sort of shunted away from normal view. And mm. we've gotten it down to almost like a, a, a comfortable science the, the way we die now. But not that very long ago, death was something that was um, very present in the everyday life. You would have seen it. You would have seen yeah. dead people. You, you would have seen your loved ones die, uh, mm. your children die. This was not something that was sort of like a, a, what we call it a natural progression of life because we live to a certain ripe old age and we pass away for the most part. But in the past, not very long ago, that wasn't the case. Lots of people shuffled off the mortal plane very early on before they were technically what we would call supposed to. And that was much more common. And so I mm. think that attitude shows a very modern mindset that hasn't actually been around for that long. Yeah, that will that will definitely be part of it. Yeah, no doubt. And and I don't like to psychoanalyze people because I know that people do this to Christians in general when it comes to their hope of the future. But um, it's very tempting to to deny death and to say that it's just a transition. It, it, it's a great way to cope with the fact that your father is lying down in front of you. Yeah. Or, you know, your child is is, is gone and to, and to think, well, you know. And so I, I read a book. I forget, I didn't read it, actually. I just browsed it. I looked at the cover and looked at what it was about. <laughs> and it was about losing a child. So a very difficult, very sensitive subject, very difficult to read for some people. And it was about the fact that your child is in heaven. And I was reading the reviews of, of say, a mother who said, I I cried with delight when reading this book as though, oh, it, it gave me the comfort that I always hoped was true. Mm. And it's like, yeah, and that's why you believe it. And I don't like saying that to right. people, but it, and I wouldn't say it to someone necessarily because it's cruel, but it's the truth. That's right. why you believe it, because you can't bear the alternative that your child is dead. Yeah. Uh, we were having, you mentioned Christopher Hitchens uh, the other day. Jessica and I were actually talking to a very open, openly atheist guy. And it was, it just struck me as so funny because all of the points that he was making were points that you would make if you were fighting against like a secularized casual, you know, uh, cultural Christian, hmm. like the idea of prayer as trying to get reality to bend to your will, like it's witchcraft. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's yeah. not, that's not something that a, that a, a Christian is going that to guy. be talking about. Right. Um, or, mm. or, or, you know, you hear them argue about hell and I'm, I'm sitting there because I'm, I'm in the camp with you with conditionalism. Mm. I'm sitting there going, yeah, I don't believe any of what you're fighting against right now. So how, how are we going to have this conversation? Because you're asserting things that I don't mm. find to be true. Yeah. <laughs> There was an atheist that debated Christopher Hitchens um, several years ago, because, of course, Christopher Hitchens is no longer alive. Um, but in the debate, um, he sort of constructed a God in which to argue against and say, mm. isn't this horrible, this thing that I've created? And yeah, the, yeah. Um, the priest or theologian, I can't quite remember what the guy's actual station was, kind of told him, look, if God were as you described him, I wouldn't believe in him either. Mm. And it does show that there is a sort of like um, straw man. That's the word I was looking for. Sort of a straw man God that is built up by people who wish to argue against him. I was mm. like, yeah, that guy sounds awful. <laughs> mm. But mm. it has nothing much to do with what is outlined in the scriptures for us. And yeah. what we yeah. can I mean, know it's, God it's, to be. And they haven't made it up. It's just they're not very good theologians. And so they'll pick up a concept of God perhaps from the kind of fundamentalism that they used to hold. That's a very common one where yeah. a person's tirade against God is almost like a eulogy for their former self. You know, I used to believe yeah. these terrible things and now I need to repent of them basically. Uh, right. Or, 
or just the snippets of, of cultural Christianity that float around, which are easy to latch onto and say, well, that's ridiculous. And then, and then okay, well, I understand why you rail against those things, but there's a certain virtue in, in patience and actually learning <laughs> learning that which you mean to criticize. Yep. Yeah. There, that was the case with me. I, I came from a secular household. I was never Christian as a child. And um, I held those sort of ideas that, like, if God is what you say he is, and it very much came from Christians who would tell me that God is going to get me, God mm. is going to get you. And mm. I thought, well, you know, this is a horrible way to think. And if the God, if, if God exists, as you point him out, then he wouldn't be worth worshiping. He would be a terrible despot. And mm. um, I set out to break down the Bible and to sort of prove how horrible all of this was. And the more, I educated myself on the matter. I actually gained faith. Mm. And it's not a transition that a lot of atheists are comfortable um, with me talking about because they want the case to be that once you're an atheist, you can never leave that position. Because your eyes have been opened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, and of course, and, and I'm not. I'm sure you you know this too. It's important not to overstate to the position as though once we understand what Scripture really teaches, then everyone will be okay with it. No, it's, it's still offensive. Right. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not. And the the risk there is that people will try to bend the Scriptures to make them more palatable for a mass audience. Yeah. Yeah. See, what happens if if, if you start out as a non-believer, or, or or even just a Christian? Yeah, let's say you start out as a Christian. And you realize that the faith contains all these offensive elements, and so you just remove them all. You might end up as an atheist, but you might just end up as a progressive Christian. Well, kind of atheist, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Um, if you just what you want is a religion that you look you look down the well to see Jesus, and you see yourself looking back at you, and you're like, "Ah, oh, I found him." <laughs> Basically, yeah. yeah. I've I've, uh, I've heard and seen a lot of that in my journey through. Just random curiosity, because we're talking. Mm. We talked about how some people view death as a as a friend, and how horrible that idea is. Um, when you hear someone say that uh, their father, grandfather, whatever has gone home upon death, does that grade at you at all? Of course, the idea is that life is an alien state, <laughs> and mm -hmm. to go home is to be right. dead. Like that's your natural. I'm like, Wait a minute! You don't belong in heaven. Why do? You, why would God bother creating the physical universe and putting people in it if they didn't belong here? Yeah, yeah, that was kind of my thought with understanding, like, why even create the body? Yeah, why yeah, I picked up on the physical that. Yeah. Universe, yeah. And I, I, it also um, makes me think about martyrs, though. And many of the stories of the martyrs are how joyfully they went to their deaths. Yeah, and it's not like there's no hope in death. Of course there is. That's why St. Paul wrote, wrote you know, to the Thessalonians and the Corinthians, like, I want you to know what's going to happen. But there's no hope in being dead. <laughs> like, that's, right. That's right. terrible. Yeah. Because I've and, heard that argument from um, secularists who will say, well, one, if, if the goal is to get to heaven, why not just put a gun between your lips and pull the trigger? Well, there's a couple of things wrong with that. Number one, it's a faulty theology of the afterlife, but also it's utilitarianism. I don't think the end justifies the means. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, 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 even if even if I was a dualist, I would still say I have an obligation to honor my body. But um, what I was going to say is, uh, and this relates to you know when someone says that their grandfather has gone home, that is not the time when I would speak up and say, no, he hasn't. Right. <laughs> You're right. Right, um, right. The worst possible time to invent a theology of death is when you need it is when someone has just died because what will happen then is you invent the theology that you wish were true <laughs> the one that is the most comforting and the one that will stop you from mourning and therefore you're not truth oriented you're <clears throat> happiness oriented um, mm. this is why the church needs to teach theology regularly so that when the occasion arises they don't need to think oh what do i tell people yeah. right well, you, you speak about, you know, talking about death or perhaps heaven, uh, near death, at death. And there is one part of the Bible where the, the thief or criminal next to Jesus yeah. dies. And he says, today you'll, you'll be with me in paradise. Mm. And I wonder, this is something that I've been kind of reading into a little bit. Um, but this is, so a lot of people talk about heaven and they talk about, paradise but they use them as if they're interchangeable so yeah. my question for you is yeah. 
are paradise and heaven interchangeable concepts? No, not at all. I mean, the idea of, I mean, I'm assuming that the word heaven means kind of an immaterial but glorious abode. Um, paradise is never used that way. Um, so the Greek word paradisos in in the Septuagint, it's you know the Greek version of the Old Testament. It refers to the Garden of Eden. And in the book of Revelation, which is the only other time in the New Testament that word appears, uh, is where it talks about the tree of life, which exists in the paradise of God. Again, referring to the Garden of Eden. Uh, paradise is creation as it should be. Namely, a wonderful, <laughs> like the best version of creation. Um, so, and, and, and given that, and people say, oh, Jew, Jew, this is evidence that Jews believed in this. There is there's no good evidence that there was a, a widespread or, or certainly anything like a consistent Jewish belief that there was a paradise uh, in the in the immaterial afterlife. But this is good evidence that Jesus was talking about earth because every other time that word appears in Scripture, that's what it meant, um, which also sustains my interpretation of what he meant by today you will be with me. Uh, I mean, you imagine being the thief. Some One of the Gospels says thief, another one says criminal. Yep. It seems like a harsh punishment for a thief. Maybe, <laughs> I, I don't know what it was, but you know, the criminal guy. Um, <laughs> you imagine being that person who hears Jesus say, today you're going to be with me in paradise. And then, as far as you're concerned, moments later, <laughs> you are with him in paradise, right? Um, he wasn't speaking to you. He wasn't speaking to the even to the reader or to the world. Someone heard him say this, but he was speaking to a man who was dying. And he was speaking to what that man, and I say this as, as a rationalization. Yes, I acknowledge that, but I, I think it makes sense. Yeah. I've always hated, um, maybe hate's a strong word. I've just liked this idea of sort of a um, heavenly waiting room where, you know, all the people who have gone before us are kind of like milling around in a uh, in-between place. Or under an altar. paradise. Do it. I said, or under an altar. <laughs> or under an altar, they're just yeah. sort of like milling around, waiting for the final judgment, and sort well, of like just yeah. milling around. They're still worshiping God, you see. Yeah, right. <laughs> and there's, and and that um, when I read that passage about the thief, and keep in mind, I'm coming from like a, a very new Christian perspective. Mm. So please, if I'm totally off base here, please correct me. But when I read that passage about the thief, and tonight you'll be with me in paradise, um, my I, idea sort of was that. When, when I die, when you die, and when Julius Caesar died, and every other person between here and there died, we're all going to sort of like, um, to use uh, earthly parlance, open our eyes at the same time. Mm. That the thief on the cross, Julius Caesar, my grandfather who died 20 years ago, me, and then my children's children's children who die, are all going to kind of like wake up. Maybe for us, it will feel as though the instant after our death that this will happen. Well, it will. Um, yeah, and that's how I interpret that passage. That's what the thief, I mean, he was telling the thief what he could expect to experience. Mm -hmm. um, Martin Luther, who doesn't, doesn't hold all the same views as me when it comes to the afterlife. He, as far as I know, held the traditional view of heaven and hell. But his view on death was infamously called soul sleep. And it was just the idea, and that's something we do have in common, well, I have in common with him, the idea that there is no conscious experience in, in death. The you're just dead. Um, uh, he, that's a big part he would of... have said that the soul exists, but that it's unconscious. So it's a little bit different from me, but the idea is that there is no experience. Uh, and that's what he said about death. He said, I will, he says, I will await, uh, when, uh, I forget the exact words, but when Jesus returns, he will knock on the grave and say, Dr. Dr. Luther or Dr. Martin, get up, and I will okay. ar arise in an instant, and I won't know what's happened in between. And it's like, oh, here I am. <laughs> and, and that's exactly what I think death will be like. Um, death is not like anything. You, you only experience the next moment of life, which is resurrection. Right, right. And so there isn't this sort of like where you're just kind of like waiting and killing time while each subsequent gen generation lives and dies and paradise becomes populated with ever more and more people. Mm. Um, mm. I just always kind of thought that that seemed like a very strange idea and even a, a kind of hell unto itself where you're sort of just like eternally waiting for this mass of generations to be born, live and die. Not to mention that a lot of people who talk about the traditional view of hell seem 
to really push the idea that this hell is equal for all. It's equal. You know, you're all in hell. You're all in fiery uh, torment. No, a lot of I, them. I tend to find that they often believe in degrees of, of suffering in hell. Ow. Mm. Some of them. Like Depend- yes, yeah, some of them. Depending on how bad you are. In fact, they'll argue against my view, which is the idea that you finally die if you're lost. And I say, well, if you finally die, how can there be degrees of punishment? And my response is, well, there are no degrees of punishment. Let me launch into all that. <laughs> There's sort of this idea of like a, a spiraling hell that goes down into different levels and the very, it's very, very bad. Yeah, the different circles right. of hell, depending on how right. wicked yeah. you were. Yeah. And then, but you I, know, at the top level, you just get paper cuts all the time or something like that. <laughs> yeah, but it's pretty a, bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a, a lot of times, like, I guess within kind of where I grew up, it was it was the idea that it was equal. And so mm. I always my question was, how could it possibly be equal if you believe that right now there are people who have been burning in hell for 6000 years? And, yeah, I mean, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I see what you mean. I see what you mean now. If there, yeah, because those who believe in the intimate state, intermediate state of Hades would say that it's a bad place still for those who are lost, but it's not as bad as, as hell will be, but it's still some kind of negative experience. And they might say point to the, the um, story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke's gospel and say, that's what hell or Hades is like now. So it's torment, but not as bad as it's going to be. Uh, I guess I guess the, those who believe that, that hell is equal for all will say, look, it's still infinity in the long run. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, I don't dwell on such explanations because I just think the whole view is <laughs> wrong. I'm sort of fascinated by this idea that um, all of these, because God's time and our time work differently, I, I would imagine for an eternal being and a linear uh, truncated life, t- the perception of time will be very, very different. So that, um, is it possible at all that when I pass away and then I open my eyes that that all of the events such as Christ breaking down the doors of Hades and pulling Adam and Eve out are things that I will witness in real time, not some past event that happened 2000 years ago when Christ died, but something that will happen all at once for all people who have passed and we will all witness these events together. Hades as in like the image, the underworld or something The underworld. Yeah. So like there's this defeating of death, like we will die. Our bodies are going to die. We're mm. going to go through that experience. We know that because we're watching the generations before us continue in that March, even though Christ has come and gone. So mm. we know that that's still our fate. Death is still our fate. So we'll experience death and then there's the resurrection. So there's this point where we're raised from the dead and mm. so is that state happening at the same time that Christ goes to Hades, breaks down the door of Hades and pulls Adam and Eve out of Hades? Yeah, I mean, if well, I mean, I don't believe in the harrowing of hell at all, which is the idea that, that Christ went into an underworld. And, and um, so I think Adam and Eve are just ashes right now. Mm. And that's, that's all they ever have been since they died. Um, because they, I don't they, believe, yeah, because I don't believe in souls, I don't believe that... Um, Christ went into the underworld and delivered souls from Hades. I think that biblical references to Hades or Sheol in Hebrew are just references to the grave or the state of death. So I I guess I thought in the beginning when you were talking about, I don't believe in souls that you were kind of doing that as a, um, just sort of like an easy way of explaining the language. But it sounds to me like there's really not a belief in souls there. Can you kind of expand on where you're going? Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I think that we really are just material. Okay. That, and when I go into the grave, uh, my body goes into the grave. That's all I ever am. It's just a physical being. Uh, I am, and there are some people who, who hold my view but will say, look, but they maybe they just like the language of souls or the King James Bible. So they say, look, I do believe in souls, but I don't mean, I don't mean an immaterial state. I just mean a person like me. Whereas I'm like, no, look. Just say you don't believe in souls because you don't, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, I really just believe that I am the dust of the earth, made alive by what Scripture calls the breath of life, and God will take the breath back when I die, and I will return to the dust. That's very interesting. I've never thought of it that way because I, 
I have associated sort of like what animates the flesh as the soul. Hmm. And um, so that's always made me kind of wonder about like animals, for example, do animals have souls because they yeah. are flesh animated. I can look at my dog and know that she has emotions. Like, yeah, I mean, my not... dog's just, I can looking at him right now. He has, he is as much of a living creature in the full sense that I am. Right. Right. And so that has made me, given me the belief that there is a, a, a spirit or a soul. I never really like delineated between those two concepts. Today was the mm. first time I've ever heard that people do that in the first place. Yeah. Um, so that, yeah, that has always been my belief that um, that breath of life is the soul, that piece of yeah. God that's been well, sort of put into the inanimate um, or the, yeah. the, the material pieces. I mean, to get, so the biblical language is, um, of the breath of life is what scripture calls the spirit. Sometimes, sometimes the translator will say spirit. Sometimes they'll say breath. Okay. Um, so that's what is breathed into you to make you alive. And that is what goes back. And if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, he's almost in despair. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm assuming because he doesn't really have the, he doesn't have the knowledge of the resurrection of the dead or how, how it all pans out. And so he's just looking around saying, you know what? What happens to the animals is the same thing that happens to humans. They've all got one breath, uh, and they all return to the dust. Uh, and and I would say, you're right. You just don't know what comes next. <laughs> right. So, and the being that comes next, that's not soul separate from body. You just think that the body and the, the and the, the spirit that animates it together as one piece. Yeah, I just say that God once again gives life to the flesh, and you become alive and and live forever. Yeah. Well, and and that's what's interesting is when they talk about the creatures in the garden, it's uh, the same word is used, at least in the King James, for the animals, which is nefesh, <laughs> or and, and they use the same word for Adam, but they translate. You've got one with one you right is now. Creatures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they translate creatures, the word nefesh, cre into creatures. That's right. So whereas Genesis with, 1 and 2, I mean, new, new, more recent translations are better than this. But if you read through Genesis 1 and 2, oh, goodness. Must be some big event on because I've got Air Force planes flying over my house. <laughs> Which I hope it's an event. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, just more COVID most curious by this. Yeah. So um, in, in the King James Bible, the authorized version, throughout Genesis 1, there are several references to living creatures. You know, the ocean will teem with them, for example. Uh, and it says creatures, uh, nefesh, nefesh chaya, the um, living creature or creature having life. And then in Genesis 2, God forms the dust God forms the man from the dust and then breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man becomes a nefesh chaya. Same thing, but instead of saying living creature, now the translator says living soul um, because of his own bias. He thinks, well, I know that humans are souls, but animals aren't, and so I'll translate that differently. Well, no, in the Hebrew, they're all the same. Interesting. I've um, I, I've ar not argued, but like internally argued with um, people who have told me that animals do not have souls and I don't, I can't understand how what animates the animals is different than what animates me. I, you know, I just don't. What, even if I was a dualist, I don't know on what authority I would say animals do not have souls. I mean, script, I mean, it's not the kind of curiosity that scripture tries to satisfy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But given that I'm not a dualist, well, every living creature is a living soul. So my dog's a soul in the same way I am. Right, right. Um, but I, again, that might just be, um, we were talking about like creating our theology to make ourselves happy. Like, <laughs> I'd like to believe that I, I will see my dog again, you know? like. Yeah, I'd like to see my dog again, but I don't think I will. Oh, bummer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could be surprised. But whatever I do see, I will be happy with. Well, I've heard versions of sort of the resurrected earth that talk about um, everything will be put back into its right state. Every creature, every tree, every flower will be put back into its right state. So how would, you know, my dog mm -hmm. not be part of that too? And and a T-Rex. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> 
that was one of be- my my first uh, she mentioned the harrowing of hell um and that's one of the things that's always that that when i was younger when i was in high school i remember reciting the apostles creed and there's the line you know he descended into hell the third yes. day he rose he rose from the the dead and i remember that was the first time i looked for that that reference. I looked for that verse because I was like, what, what does this mean? Because in my mind, the word hell's so loaded, it means the eternal place of punishment. Mm -hmm. And I heard someone tell me that what happened was when Jesus died, he went to hell and suffered for eternity and then came back. Oh, there is a, the, yeah, that's definitely not what the Apostles' Creed meant. <laughs> no, they <laughs> right. meant the, the, the descent ad infernus, which is the Latin equivalent of Hades, which is the intermediate state where the saints were waiting uh, to, yeah. to enter paradise. So that's what that meant. I I prefer the Nicene Creed, which in English anyway just says he descended to the dead. Okay, fine. He did that. <laughs> um, or does it even say that? I don't recall. But anyway, where was I? Oh, yeah, there is a... There is a movement, um, and it's a quote unquote evangelical slash Pentecostal charismatic one, which re- which reasons that well, we know that the punishment for sins is not death, it's the torment of hell. So the death of Christ on the cross, cross did not atone for sin. The only way for sin to be atoned would be for after Jesus died, for him to go to hell and be tormented by the devil. And this yeah. became, um, a fairly controversial belief for obvious reasons, uh, taught by what's called the Word of Faith movement. So you get yeah. people like Kenneth Hagen, uh, Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen, and, and, and folks like that. Creflo. Um, it's it's terrible. I mean, it's yeah. the, the consistent Christ, Christian teaching from the beginning has been that the death of Christ atones for sin. But 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 this is what people are prepared to do uh, once they believe in eternal torment. They won't look at the cross and say, "Oh, maybe I was wrong about." The punishment for sin. No, they'll look at the cross and go, well, I'm so attached to the doctrine of eternal torment, I guess I have to give up the traditional Christian doctrine of the atonement <laughs> and say that it didn't, didn't, the cross didn't do it, uh, which is appalling. Yeah. Well, yeah. let me ask you, because you may have some thoughts on this, is it does, it does talk about how he, um, uh, was it preached to those that were in prison? I believe that's what the verse says. I'll preach to those who are now in prison. Well, it depends on which uh, which verse are you talking about, because these verses are often conflated. So there's one in Second Peter, which says that um, that Christ was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by which he also preached to those spirits who are now in prison during the uh, something like during the days of Noah, while while Noah waited patiently, and, and so on. It's, it's a strange yeah. um, passage, and I. I don't think that describes anything that happened in, in while Jesus was dead, uh, because the passage says he was ma- he was put to death in the flesh, but but made alive by the Spirit. Now, some people think that means sort of awakened in the underworld, <laughs> but no, it, yeah. it's it's resurrection. He was made alive by the Spirit, by which he also like not at that same time, <laughs> but by which he also preached to. Um, and the idea, I think, is that he preached through the prophets to those yeah. who are now in prison, to those who died uh, long ago. In other words, it's the same spirit that resurrected Christ that's been convicting people of their sin for centuries. Yeah, millennia. Hmm. Yeah, so then that, and that's kind of where I sort of landed. But that was always the proof text when people were talking about whatever version of the harrowing of hell that they were talking about. Mm. And so I've always been. Oh, yeah, very... I know it's used that way. I just it's a very slender basis for for, for the Jessica. Were you going to say something? I I was only going to say that um, as far as the Orthodox, the we when we read the Nicene Creed, it says that he suffered and was buried, and yeah. then on the third day he rose again. And so to my mind, that always referred to the cross that he suffered on the cross, um, yeah. was buried, There's... and then on the third day rose again. Yeah, there's no mention of hell in the Nicene Creed. Right. Yeah. Uh, or at least at yeah. that point. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, what I, was, what I was actually thinking of is that there are some, I guess, slightly sanitized versions of the Apostles' Creed, which mm. don't say he descended into hell in English. They they translate Infernus as the dead. So they'll say he descended to the dead, which I prefer because it's more defensible. 
<laughs> yeah, you're right. The Nicene Creed just says he suffered and was buried the third day he rose yeah. again, which, yeah, I'm, cool. I'm a Nicene boy. <laughs> <laughs> Cody Cook uh, commented, the wages of sin is eternal torment, but we could cram that into a couple of days. Romans yeah. 624. <laughs> But no, it's, it's, it's wild because there are these little, it, you know, I, I don't know how you feel about this deconstruction trend that's going on right now, mm -hmm. but it, it grates me in all, all the, the fun ways because, you know, like as I grew up and I learned more about God, learned more about Jesus, learned more about the Bible, went to Bible school, read a whole bunch of books and all of this, I never felt like I was breaking down something, but rather kind of correcting things that I was like people misspoke or didn't know or said things wrong. Maybe mm. it was just bad theology period, but there's this idea. I'm just, I haven't talked to anyone about deconstruction and I kind of want to get where, see where you are because it's like every time I hear someone talk about how they're deconstructing, it's all the end point is always seemingly atheism or at least agnosticism. Yeah, I think people are bestowing a kind of intellectual respect on what they're doing by using the word deconstructing. All they're really doing is explaining why they no longer believe. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I, and it's it's not it's, it's not a new thing in practice. It's just a new thing in name. Uh, people used to do this all the time without using the word deconstruction. And so I'll read, you know, there's, I think there's a blog or something called The Former Fundy. I'm like, well, that's telling, isn't it? <laughs> um, the reason that, and then they'll describe the faith that they rejected and the reasons they rejected it. And I'm like, I don't recognize that religion. It's not, it's right. not what I believe. It's, um, yeah. And, was, and so really what they're doing is rejecting their former self. Yeah. Well, I think maybe the most disappointing deconstruction that I saw was Rhett and Link. Do you know them? On no, but I've, I've heard of, I've heard that this happened, but I haven't watched it. I don't watch. I mean, these things are viral. I'm like, yeah, I get what's going on. I'm not interested in yeah. watching them. I I didn't watch it because I didn't want to. Because I, you know, I would watch their stupid. Uh, they used to work for Phil Vischer, I think, in Big Idea. They used to work for the Veggie Tales people, and then they had their YouTube show, and I'd watch it all the time. They'd have stupid things like, uh, "Can you hot dog? Can, can this be hot dogged?" And they'd make disgusting hot dog. I mean, it was just like good things to watch for the kids. And then I'm watching it one day with my kids and they're like, oh, we're going to be talking about how we left Christianity. And I'm like, not on the kids program that I'm watching with my children. You're not. <laughs> mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that what that leads to is I think that there is I, I don't understand. I mean, I do understand what deconstruction is, because every time I hear someone talking about it, it never leads to more grounded theology. It mm. just leads to removing theology and it goes from like the simple things to get rid of down to the fundamentals of the faith, you know? Um, but there are a lot of people and I think that deconstruction and this giant wave of it and the ex evangelical movement, all these different things really go to show not just that people don't understand the secondary doc doctrines, but that, they don't understand the primary doctrines, which can you, these are. Go ahead. Can you tell me what you mean? What is the difference between a primary doctrine and a secondary doctrine? Well, I would say primary would be Christ and Christ crucified, resurrection. Oh, okay. right. Like when we talk, talk about primary versus tertiary beliefs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And you okay, know, yeah, gotcha. just primary, ter secondary, tertiary. There are some that are just okay. like this should not separate anyone in in. Uh, Right. I don't know if any of these primary, secondary, tertiary, but there's some that are so silly that people stop being friends over. And I call mm -hmm. those tertiary because it's just like, <laughs> this is like third tier. This isn't even right. second tier. Let's, let's not do that. Um, right. But with all of that going on, I think that there's a lot of people who don't understand. It's not that they just don't understand hell or they don't understand, um, the Holy Spirit or spiritual gifts or this, that, or the other that people can disagree on, but they don't understand the fundamentals. Hmm. And so if I'm, if, if you were talking to someone who came up to you and was talking about heaven or 
uh, the intermediate state or what, whatever, and you were to describe to them the hope of that is shown in the New Testament through Jesus, how would you describe that to them? Like, like if you were to put it in flowery words, in some sense, how would you? Well, I, I would try not to put it in flowery <laughs> words. The idea is that um, human beings find themselves alienated from God and from each other through sin, and we're not all that we could be. And and part of that is that we are mortal and subject to death. And, um, the New Testament says that we are part of the present order and we are passing away, but that doesn't have to be the case, that God loves us and that he, he came into the world um, uh, through, and would, would I necessarily describe the distinction between the Son and the Father? Probably, yeah, I'd say he sent his Son into the world to identify as one of us, to endure what we endure, to live the perfectly righteous life and to take death in our place, uh, to reconcile us to God so that we could know him and be united to him and to each other, and so that things could be put right and we could uh, have everlasting life with him. Basically. And, yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> Where flattering. do I sign? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I just, I, I love reading what you've written. I, like I, I told you earlier, I think I read probably... 16 to 20 of your articles today while I was working. Good heaven. That's indoctrination. That? <laughs> I was just, well, what, what happened was, you know, I, I was like, I wonder what he's written about the resurrection. And then uh, I, I got into the physicalism stuff and I, you know, I went all in kind of different directions, by the way, which, when is part three coming out? Oh, the, what the Bible says about the, the body. Gosh, I don't have time to do that. I mean, uh, <laughs> It'll be it'll be done when it's done. <laughs> yeah, I know it's been years, but um, see, I'm working and I have a family and I have a side business of of, of building guitars, which is fun. But I'm also back in the oh. study doing a psychology degree, so I don't have time for anything. He is George R R Martining you right now. <laughs> <laughs> but so one of the the examples that I was looking forward to, um, in that series was you talking about the Witch of Endor. And oh yeah, Samuel. that's a that's a that's a fun example. Yeah, would you mind talking about your thoughts on that? Because I'm that that's what I was looking for. I was like, oh, it'll be in the second one. Well, see, I've, I've kind of I've I've kind of quickly browsed other people's thoughts, and, and I thought, yeah, they seem okay, but um, I haven't written that that blog post yet. Um, and part of that is it has to do with the fact that I haven't had time to to really yeah. do the research and say, okay, what angle am I going to go with here? Because there are angles you can go with. Um, number one is that, um, so what this, so the idea is that, um, the King's having a hard time, right? Uh, things aren't going well for him, but, um, Samuel's not around anymore. He, he hasn't got any prophetic advice. So he says, Hmm, which is a, which is a band because, you know, it's against the law of God to have necromancers, which is basically what they were in this context. So I'm going to go secretly to Endor. This is which there, and I'm going to see if I can get some advice from the prophet Samuel about what to do because I need this. And basically, witches are frauds. You know, necromancy is not real. Um, but this witch got the fright of her life, uh, and, and the text makes it evident. She cried out. She's like, "Oh, what?" Um, and, and and the king says, "What do you see?" And she says, "I can see a god coming up out of the earth." People don't realize that it says that. Because Elohim. some tra translations say uh, a spirit or, or a specter or a ghost, you know, depending on your translation. But the word is El, uh, Elohim, rather than the plural. Elohim, I can see a, a god or gods coming up out of the earth. In other words, I can see some terrifying apparition that I didn't expect to see. Uh, and it's like it's like it's a god. Um, and, and, and he says, really, look closer. What do you see? And she says, well, it's this old man dressed in burial cloths. Interesting. Uh, from a dualist point of view, that's interesting. I mean, spirits don't wear burial cloths, so why, right. why, why? I mean, if if anything was actually present, it um, raises the question of number one: why was she seeing something coming up out of the ground? Because that's what she described. Why was it wearing burial cloths? That's not what a ghost wears. Yeah, if if ghosts were real, they're immaterial spirits. Uh, so uh, is, is the idea, and, and then and then Samuel says, "Why have you disturbed me?" The idea is that I was dead, and, and you've disturbed me. It it has it is described the way that one might describe a resurrection. 
Um, mm. At least that's the way it reads to me. Something came up out of the ground, gave you the fright of your life. It's got burial cloth wrapped around it. Um, that that sounds to me like a, either that or it was something like a, a divinely enabled vision where God delivers this message via this apparition of Samuel. Um, but I don't, and there are some who, and I, I have, I will have to read them and understand why they say this, because it's. Scholars I respect who have said this, I just don't know why, they've said that it was an evil spirit. I'm like, why would you say that? Why would an evil spirit? Because the message seems to be on point and everything. Why would it? So I'll read that. That sounds interesting, but I probably won't probably won't agree with it. Um, I guess my point is there are possible explanations other than this was the ghost of Samuel. Yeah. Possible. I mean, I mean I'll admit it's a freaking unusual thing. Um, yeah. You don't see anything like this anywhere else in Scripture, but... Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and doesn't well, and he it, essentially tell him that you shouldn't be doing this? Yeah, he says, like, you shouldn't have called me. He said, you're going to die and so are your sons. <laughs> uh, in fact, he says, you're, you're going to be with me. Uh, in other words, so he doesn't say you're going to die. He says, you're going to be with me. Well, does he say you're going to die? But either way, you're going to be with me means you're going to die because I'm dead. Right. And that, that's one of those questions that I always found interesting because people – you know, I would I won't lump in the more uh, secular view, but people talk about ghosts, and that was always something that I used when I was talking to them about why I don't believe there are ghosts, is because she seemed genuinely surprised that she was talking to a dead person, mm. and so mm. that surprise in and of itself tells me that that was not a normal experience for her. Maybe she'd experienced something else. Maybe it had been in the past uh, demons or, you know, however you want to talk about that. Perhaps she had consulted with demons, but whatever comes from that conversation, it does show that she was never talking to human spirits before that moment. No, no, she did not expect that to happen. Well, the text reads as though she did not expect that to happen. Yeah. And what's interesting about that is in my 20s, I made extra money on the side by reading tarot cards, bought a pack of tarot cards, read in the book how to do it, and um, paid my rent one summer uh, just milling around in the park, turning cards for people. Wow. I never I never had any special power. I never had any extra sensory perception. Mm. It basically teaches you how to cold read people. And cold reading is you kind of um, look for um, physical cues, vocal cues that kind of tell you what this person wants to hear, and then you feed it to them. And you do it with the sort of vehicle of the cards. And I can very much imagine if I had been turning cards for someone and some disembodied voice or some disembodied spirit suddenly appeared to tell them their future, it would have given me a heart attack. And that's so exactly I, what happened here. Yeah. I can very <laughs> much relate to that woman's experience. <laughs> like, mm. Can we talk just very, very briefly about the transfiguration? Because I am so yeah. jealous of those dudes. Because in the very I don't know, least. It sounds like a very scary experience, to be honest. But no, I, but I'm, well, well, they they just, seem to think it was great. Because um, uh, uh, I forget which one of the disciples either. spoke up and said, hey, Jesus, it's so good that we can be here to see this. Um, let's pitch a tent, one for Moses and one for Elijah. Uh, see, I really like that passage. Some people like it for other reasons. Some people like it because they think it establishes their view on the afterlife. I think it tells us nothing about the afterlife. Mm. Um, so the passage says that they saw Jesus in, on, on the mountain, and then while they were watching, all of a sudden he became bright and his clothes became super white and there appeared uh, and I've always wondered how they knew it was Moses and Elijah. Maybe, maybe, maybe Jesus said, "Hi, Moses. Hi, hi I don't, maybe however, they, does. however, they, yeah. <laughs> hi, hello, my Mormon, name is Mormons. Moses. Yeah, <laughs> hello, my name is Moshe. <laughs> Moshe, yeah. Um, <laughs> but what's interesting is in in one of the Gospels, I think it's Matthew's. I didn't remember this because I wasn't expecting to bring it up, but I think it's Matthew's Gospel, or it could be Mark, whatever. But after the after they're coming down the mountain, Jesus Matthew said seventeen, I think. Okay, so you know what I'm gonna say. <laughs> Jesus said, Tell no one about the vision until um 
these following things have happened and you're ready to go and proclaim the gospel and so on. Uh, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. Jesus called it a vision. Uh, the word horama there is um, the standard word for a vision of something that is not physically present. So, you know, when, so when, for example, Peter was on the, on the rooftop and he saw the animals being lowered down from heaven, you could say, well, this tells us, this teaches us that there are animals up in heaven and there's this sheet holding them and it can go up and down. And <laughs> he came up with this bizarre understanding of an, of, of an animal elevated to heaven. Or you could just believe what he says later when he when he's describing the event and he calls it a vision, horama, something that's not physically present, but which is teaching him something. It's a, it's a divine message, but it's not it's not what you actually see that matters. Is what it means, um, and that's what. And the NIV unfortunately um, blurs that as it so often does with other things. It's not yeah. the worst translation in the world, but um, the NIV says, "Tell tell no one what you have seen," which I mean, it's it's strictly true. But it really it blunts. Yeah, you, know, you you don't get to to see that Jesus is calling this event a vision. Um, the question, of course, is what does the vision mean? Um, and I think it means, <laughs> this is my opinion. I think it means that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. The prophets represented by Elijah. The law represented, obviously, by Moses. And they were talking about um, the things that were about to unfold in the life of Jesus. But um, I certainly don't think it's a it's a good source of of theology on the afterlife. I think that wh why I'm jealous is because when you when Peter Peter James and John right see this, they get to see Jesus transfigured, which mm. is like they get to s catch a glimpse of the resurrection. They get to catch a glimpse of the you know what human beings are supposed to look like what we're supposed to be or you know in the end you know what i mean i think that mm. you disagree <laughs> I, don't, I, I doubt i doubt that we will be you know, shining and yeah and <laughs> but you, I, I don't quite think i no, i don't i don't quite think that <laughs> no. i just mean like a, a, a little piece not like the full-on understanding they got to see yeah. something that was more perfect i would imagine that if you saw like human beings probably couldn't see the full piece because doesn't it say none shall see the face of god and live so it makes sense to me that when jesus is showing them this piece of like heavenly light or what the what his um true aspect is um that they do fall down on the ground terrified and that is part of the passage that they fall down scared of what they're seeing and i always connected that to the passage um i guess in the old testament that says none shall see the face of god and live so that, that he's showing them this piece of his true self, but that it's terrifying to them. It's very difficult for them to like process what they're seeing. Yeah, I, yeah. I won't. I won't try and offer an explanation of what it, of why he looked at the way he did. But yeah, one way, one way, impossible thing is it is that it was as though his deity was was showing through. Um, mm -hmm. It's like the mask was slipping. Or or peeled back on purpose, like this is a little bit of what, like Moses coming. Down what's from under the here? Mountain. Yeah, I want you to know who I really am. Mm. <laughs> and that it would be terrifying for someone on Earth, a human being, to be exposed to that. You wouldn't, you wouldn't even know how to process it. And that's why I always kind of thought, because there is that one line that says they fell down terrified. Mm. And I always thought, well, yeah, because if you were to see God, it would kill you. And that's a terrifying prospect. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. I love it. I love I love hearing my little artful brain thinking things and then someone go, ah. <laughs> there's my line. <laughs> I should shut up now. <laughs> 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 so I I have truly enjoyed talking to you because I've seen you type. We've typed back and forth a, a couple times over the years. Um, but I always love your sense of um, humor and the fact that you're not only knowledgeable, but you'll also just goof around the same way I will. And I, I appreciate that. And also, one, one thing I want to commend you on is how when you're in an argument on either in comments on Facebook or on your blog, you're always like very um, clear and that that's not what I said. You are you're changing the argument out of my mouth, and you will you will you will listen to what I said and repeat it, or I or I'm going to not 
respect your response. <laughs> Actually, that sounds a bit short, <laughs> but it's it's not. I mean, I, I really what's that? What is really good because a lot of times when you see people having these kind of discussions on the internet, the person will will say something that they didn't say, and the other person gets angry and like essentially storms off and becomes mean. And you're just like, that's not what I said. If you'd like to look at what I said and then you know actually get mm -hmm. in the ballpark with me then we can continue this conversation otherwise i don't know how to and i think that that's great yeah that's true i don't yeah because you're not mad you can't, <laughs> yeah. you can't expand this you're um right. endless runway where they're taking everything that you're saying out of context and then you have to walk down every mile of road yeah to get back to is, where you are in the yeah, that is place. a general practice that i've taken on board like um Every person who wants to argue with you, well, it's an invitation. It's not an obligation. Mm -hmm. And you have to be wise about how you spend the limited time that you have. Yeah. Uh, and, and so you say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to I, – I'm just letting you know that I'm not going to engage if, if that's what you do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I just disengaged almost entirely from arguing. Like I, I will have a discussion with someone, but – I in 2016 there there was a good time for me to stop arguing with people and I don't know why that would happen in America in 2016 but that's when it mm. happened. <laughs> well, while we're while we're complimenting Glenn, I'd like to say um, I very much like how you would say I read a book. Well, no, I didn't read it. I looked at the cover. <laughs> many many people will never admit to doing that kind of thing, and I just it shows a lot of strength of character in my opinion. <laughs> That you admit to doing that because I do the same thing. It's like, uh, I, I looked at that book. I didn't read that book. Yeah, and I look so, at it and say, okay, it's kind of about this, but I'm not going to read it. <laughs> right, right. Because, again, we have a limited time on the planet. Yeah, You're not going right. to have time to read every book. Sometimes you just look at a cover. They say don't judge a book by its cover, but how else are you supposed to know what books are about? I do judge it by its blurb. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> so speaking of books... Um, what book would you recommend me, Jessica, or any of the people in our audience read? Like what's, Ooh. it could be recent, it could be all time. Is there anything you think people should read if they're Christian? Uh, and they're yeah, curious? A, book, read, so. a book about the resurrection of the dead? It could be about anything. Any book that what you think those... I need to what... read. Um, hmm. See, a lot of the, a lot of the views I have, um, they're not really associated with books. They're, they'll be like a conversation that I followed in journals. So someone will publish an article and then someone will publish a response article. And I think, oh, has he got him there? And they'll be or, or, or following <laughs> online conversations or just, just my own sort of musings and thinking. Mm -hmm. But there are some good books like that. Uh, I say, I wish I'd known you were going to ask me this because I, <laughs> I didn't know. It's, I, it's, I, know I know what the covers look like, but what are the names of them? There's one called, but I'll find them just now because it's not hard to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do have the Library of Alexandria in electronic form, literally at our fingertips, which is an amazing time to be alive. <laughs> okay, so there's a decent book called, let's wait for it to come up, called In Search of the Soul, Four Views of the Mind-Body Problem, published by InterVarsity. Um, okay. and, and it's edited by Joel Green. Pretty Most of what Joel Green does is 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 pretty decent quality. Uh, Joel Green and Stuart Palmer, and it's got contributions by uh, Nancy Murphy, William Hasker, Kevin Corcoran, Stuart Gritz. Um, that's a really good book. Um, although it's, it's mostly wrong because, you know, it's, it's, four <laughs> it's got four, four views and only one yeah. of them I broadly agree with, and that's Nancy Murphy. Um, but generally speaking, I would recommend books of that nature, partly because I have a very short attention span and I find it difficult to read a long monograph by one person. Yeah. So these are people who have been forced to write an essay explaining themselves, which I, I really prefer. It forces yeah. succinctness and clarity. You don't get a whole chapter to pursue uh, uh, just a, a rabbit trail that happened to come up. Uh, and there's another one like this. Let me see if I can find it. I really liked the uh, I've read I've read a couple of the different views books. One of the ones that I really liked was the four views of the atonement. I think Greg Boyd is um, one of the oh, yeah. writers yeah, I know in the there. One. I haven't read it, but I do know of it. It's like I really enjoy that. Um, but the the problem is if 
if you know they put the the one you if they put the most compelling one at the first part of the book it's hard to read the next three views mm. um <laughs> <laughs> okay. The other one is called What About the Soul, edited by Joel Green, and it's also a multi-author uh, volume on, on, on the same theme. Very good, although perhaps not so biblical in its orientation, but it's just a, a good discussion. Um, I mean, when it comes to the, the sort of views that I'm, I'm kind of known for, um, uh, this is one of them, and those are two good books. When it comes to the doctrine of eternal punishment, um, read me <laughs> because I've written a few things about it and I quite like the things that I've had to say, but um, Edward Fudge is the classic, the fire that consumes it's now in its third edition. Um, there are a couple of different versions of uh, four views on hell. One that was published some decades ago with, with, with one set of authors and there's a, a recent one with a, with a whole new set of authors, but it's always good just to, to look at the way that those people engage with each other. Um, there's a very good book being written at the moment. Uh, edited by Chris Date and Paul Copen. Not everyone knows about this because it's still being written, but it's two views on hell uh, with each author. There's an author on each side. There's uh, conditional immortality and eternal torment, and it's divided up into subject areas. So there's um, uh, biblical exegesis, a systematic theology, philosophy, biblical theology, I'm writing the biblical theology section for conditional immortality, but it looks like it's going to be a very good volume when it does come out. I'm not sure when that will happen. Um, the first book I ever read on conditional immortality is by an obscure author who, who is no longer alive named Sidney Hatch called Daring to Differ, uh, Adventures in Conditional Immortality. That was really enjoyable and clear. Um, but yeah, read blogs. Blogs are good, and, yeah. and I guess as quickly as possible, get good at at um, learning the difference between a quality blog and and just some trash, <laughs> because there are some very very good blogs out there. But of course, you know the internet's a jungle. Yeah. And so, do do you? One of the things that when we had Chris on, there were a couple of universalists in the chat, like making snide remarks the whole time for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, if if did have you done a, a solid treatment of universalism and how you view it on your website? I haven't, no, and I'm probably not going to. I, okay. <laughs> and some people get annoyed by my attitude, but it's not a view that I am able to take very seriously. Yeah, I understand that completely. I'm. Uh, do you know of someone who's spoken about it that has? Uh, do I know? Not, not that I'm just like, hey, give me something to beat up on it. But yeah, like... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this again, this is the kind of thing that um, it, it, it's a discussion. I mean, I've I've read, I've looked through. <laughs> I want to be careful in my claims. I've looked through fairly closely a couple of universalist books, but most of the discussion that I observe is again online in articles and responses to okay. things. So, David Bentley Hart's book that all may be saved has is um has got a lot of online responses, and I've browsed through some of those, and they look quite good. But uh, there's nothing in particular that I would suggest. No. Gotcha. Because that, that's one of those things that just I, I'm I'm mildly curious in reading about it some more just because every argument that I've ever heard for it has been bad. Yeah. I mean, there was a, um, a kind of low key documentary, I mean, by which not hugely famous, but it was a documentary and that it was um, a, a piece that interviewed people from well, mostly from three camps, from those who believe in annihilationism, from those who believe in eternal torment, and mostly universalists. It was essentially a piece of material that was intended to promote universalism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so you would have people like, like Chris Date was on it, I was on it, and we were talking about, say, for example, Matthew 10, 28, about God who can destroy body and soul in hell and, and so on, and how we how we maintained that this supported conditional immortality. And then you had like a, a universalist guy on there saying, that God can just uh, that that um, the world, the devil, or whatever can can destroy your your body, but not your ideas. And then <laughs> I was like, "Oh, come on, man, get off this ridiculous flight of fancy." And this is this is what I always encounter. I mean, people tell me that universalists have got great biblical arguments, but every time I hear one, it's always these flaky pieces of nonsense. That I'm like, "Why would I devote my time to this? It's just no, go away." Yeah. 
Well, like the the one that I've heard the most is it's, that's why I said snide. It's kind of flippant things like, "Wow, you know, Christians really, other Christians really get offended when you talk about how much grace God has." And I'm like, <laughs> "Oh, so you're saying that we don't believe in God's grace?" Of course, because but you don't. don't hold this one thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> And so that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's never been a good argument. And so I'm like, is there a good well, stuff argument? like my God is powerful enough to? Uh, pff, okay, yeah, yeah. That's the difference between you and me on how powerful God is. Yeah. <laughs> well, like I said, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate talking to you. I want to talk more. So hopefully, we you had enough fun on this show that in the future you'll come back and we can talk about some other stuff. Yeah, it was great. Um, but uh, before before we we let you go, I did want to make sure people knew how to find you. Um, so I have a couple of things if you want to add, feel free to, but if you want to follow Glenn on Twitter, you can do that at right reason underscore NZ. And he, you could also read his writing and his blogs, which is what I spent most of my day doing while I was working, um, over at rightreason.org. And he's also a big part of rethinking hell, which we, like I said earlier, we spoke to Chris date about last year, last October. Um, and so if you want to learn more about final judgment what hell really is um at least the closest i've seen it pointed to in scripture you can go to rethinkinghell.com uh what anything else that you, you want to throw uh, out just, there just beware if you're going to follow me on twitter it can be a bit of a wild ride <laughs> uh, same here like it was so funny because i i tagged you in on twitter and i followed you and i was like oh gosh i hope i don't say too dirty is too dirty of words out here because <laughs> oh, no, i'm american no, no. we don't if have you want <laughs> yeah yeah i mean if you want to kind of follow my respectable thoughts my my blog is the place to go and you can contact me there if you want to as well yeah um so i i, I will pose the question to you even though we've talked about it the whole episode you can choose something else um, but over the past two years there's been a lot of people who have reached the point of desperation, de despondency. There's been a lot of bad stuff that's happened. Mm. And so one of the things we wanted to do with this show was to help, you know, let it be a source of light, a source of hope, and to point to things that are hopeful. And so we ask this of everyone, Christian or not. Um, and some, so sometimes it's like my dog. I really love my dog, <laughs> and that gives me hope. Um, so, I mean, if, could you tell us what you, what's something that gives you hope and motivation to carry on right now? And it could be literally anything you want to say. Mm. Gosh, I mean, my only hope in life and in death, and this is a this is the Westminster Catechism. I, I don't actually remember the answer properly, but my only hope in life and death is that I belong to Christ. Um, it, you know, I can't even imagine hoping in the things that people put their hope in, like, like who's going to win the next election, then things will yeah. be okay. Uh, what's going to happen with this war or the dollar or, or the price of oil or something? Or, Crypto. or if this vote on this piece of legislation, then things will be okay. No, they won't. No, they won't. Um, you know, go to a graveyard and just look around and I just you know look, read read what's on the headstones and and think about think about the people think about yeah you know, people you know people related to you connected to you people you've lost and just think if if this didn't have to be the end if 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 there was any chance that this wasn't it wouldn't you take it? Yeah. Yeah. How could that not be the most important thing that you will ever consider? And for me, that's it. Um, you know, we are worried about the wrong stuff. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's something that I've had to keep drilling into my own head is, you know, there was, there was a time that we didn't have these kinds of conversations on this show. There was a time it was all about po political stuff That's right. and that that was awful and i i came to realize that i had started preaching a different gospel in a sense and it was kind of and I, I didn't think i was you know i didn't think that me talking about freedom or whatever was going to be the end all be all i always believed that it was jesus that it was a resurrection mm. but my actions didn't show that. 
Yeah, and it's not that that stuff is nothing. I mean, it's something, and it, and it, and it can matter, it can help people, and it can promote happiness, but it's not the answer to anything, really. No. Kingdom is. Mm. Well, thank you for that. I think that that was one of the best ones we've had in a while. So it's very, very enriching for me personally. Thank you. Good. So, thank you. Thank you so much. If you ever want to come back, we can we can chat about it. Hopefully, you do. Um, <laughs> but I'll let you go. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, both of you. It's been a pleasure. And yeah, let's do it again. Awesome. Definitely. See you. Right. All right. See you, folks. All right. For the rest of you people, you wonderful people, uh, I'm going to tell you what's coming up. We have we have some cool stuff coming up next week. We're talking to Ben Brown which I had the realization the other day way too late. And I can't believe I didn't figure it out earlier, but Bren, Ben Brown is going to come on our show. He's a comedian now, but he's coming on our show because he grew up on a Mormon polygamist compound and he got away from that. That's interesting to me. I want to hear about that. But I, my wife had sister wives on in the, in the other room the other day. And I thought about, I was like, Ben Brown, and then I realized that um, his last name is the same last name as those people from Sister Wives. And I actually looked into it, and he is the nephew of Cody Brown from Sister Wives. Whoa. <laughs> what? <laughs> right. So, that, so that'll be next week. I'm really excited about that. After that, we're going to wrap up the month with Brad. He's coming back. Um, right after that, we have a guy named GW coming on. Last year, we tried to do October, and we wanted to have a conversation about death. And when I say we wanted to have a conversation about death, we wanted to have a conversation about Physical. death as a reality, physically. Right. And so at that point, I was looking for someone who, you know, kind of had hands-on experience, someone who was a mortician or whatever. Um, and I couldn't find that person. There aren't that many of them out there. But I connected with this guy named GW, and he is a, um autopsy tech and an embalmer. And he, he has a TikTok. He's very interesting. And so that's what a lot of people wanted to hear. And so we're going to do that. We're going to talk about the nitty gritty and how ugly and horrible death actually is mm -hmm. and how we need to pay attention to that. Um, and after that, we're going to talk to our friend Stephen Ignoramus again. At this point, he is now clear to talk about how he was at the, the January 6th insurrection and uh, what happened with him and his sentencing from the FBI. So we'll we'll see what that's about. Uh, so it's going to be a, a very exciting few things. Uh, beyond that, if you want to follow me on Twitter, that's where I try not to say bad words. That's at Ham Carlos. If you want to follow, I do. I I used the one of the bad ones the other day, and I was like, I haven't done this in a while. It felt weird, but I've been trying. Okay, I, but I, they're fun. sometimes it's too funny not to. All right, <laughs> and if you if you want to to see what what soup you should eat this week. You can go over to Jessica's Twitter at soup canarchist. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, hit like hit subscribe, share with your friends, get it out there. That will help us grow. Once we hit a thousand, we can start monetizing directly. Uh, we started late on the YouTube game. So it's taking us a little bit longer to get that going. We've been, I was audio for, I've been doing this for since like 2016 and it was always mm -hmm. audio. So this is a different thing. So if you want to help do that, um, if you want to catch early episodes like this one, like a couple of our, our patrons did tonight, you can go to patreon.com slash the mad ones. I told you all that you get from there. Um, beyond that t-shirt and mugs at we are the mad ones.com slash store. Uh, if you're listening, you can watch every Wednesday at 8 30 PM at youtube.com slash the mad ones. We're also on Rockfin and odyssey. If you do want to listen, we are on every podcatcher or you can go to we are the mad ones.com and download and listen directly there. That's it. That's all I've got for you. Any parting words for the lovely people, Jessica? Um, I would just say that now is the time to start your seeds if you're planting a garden. So don't forget <laughs> to do that. All right. So as always, you have a chance to be a light in the world. So go light it up. <laughs>